Hi there everybody and you are very welcome to the very first episode of the South Tip Arts podcast which is a new project um, being undertaken by South Tipperary Arts Centre. Our aim is to bring you up-to-date information on what's happening within professional arts practices in the South Tipperary area particularly and um, to keep you all informed on things that may be happening in your local area that you might not be aware of. My name is Emer, and I'll be the host. We've just launched a new email address for you to get in contact with the podcast and that is southtipartspodcast at gmail.com. The Arts Centre is a really important hub for people to collaborate with each other through and hopefully this podcast will aid in that process and have a beneficial impact on the area overall. So I spoke to Arts Centre Manager Clean Amar about uh, our aims for the podcast and what we are hoping to achieve with it. Well, I suppose to use the podcast as a tool to disseminate information about the arts in South Tip. Uh, when I moved back to Clonmel two years ago, a lot of people sort of said to me, there's nothing going on, you'd be so bored, you're coming from a city. And what I've discovered is that there is just a wealth of activity and really amazing and, and innovative things being done in the arts in South Tipperary, but it's a bit of a hidden secret because even, I suppose, some individual artists don't know what other people are doing, uh, people living in the area, people coming to visit the area. It's quite difficult to track down where to go and what to do. You, you sort of have to be in the know. So I suppose the ideal of the podcast is that everybody be in the know uh, about what's happening in the arts in this area and in this region. It is true that the perception would be that there's nothing going on around here. When there's an awful lot happening. And I think there's also, I think because there have been particular difficulties in the infrastructure in this region. I mean, obviously all sectors of the arts have, have had infrastructure problems over the last number of years with the economic downturn. But Clonmel was particularly hard hit because the Arts Centre lost its Arts Council funding and had always been a little limited by the fact that the Arts Centre is a gallery with a studio space and doesn't have a performance space. So I think the Arts Centre, since its establishment 20, over 20 years ago, needed to go out there and find people and do things with them and work quite hard towards creating spaces. Now, that's very, very interesting and very valuable. But when the funding uh, was lost, the, the focus sort of turned very, very inward and the focus was on keeping the doors open and it really shrank back to being just a gallery space with workshops in the studio. Now, that was invaluable. It kept the mm -hmm. doors open and the team of volunteers who did that, I, I think Clonmel is going to be forever grateful to them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but what we've shown over the last two years is that when you have kind of a professionally run arts centre, the range of work is greater and the impact is... Uh, is, is increased and I think that will only continue in the future you know I think one of the kind of the important achievements over the last couple of years is the Clonmel Art Studios so it, the first I suppose, iteration of which will open in probably April at this stage and it will be you know a studio space for artists in the town and I think it just a lot of people work in home-based studios or work in borrowed spaces I know one sort of significant local artist goes to Dublin two days a week uh, to work in a studio there so I think the idea of having spaces where people can be more visible in their work mm. in the visual arts will be beneficial and again the podcast will celebrate that we'll talk to those artists we'll mm -hmm. talk to visiting artists mm -hmm. um we'll talk to musicians we'll talk to choreographers we'll talk to sort of the range of people working as professional arts practitioners in South Tipperary. So really I suppose the the role of the centre and then by extension, the role of this podcast project is to just show people that there is a hub and there is a, a mm. central space of, you know, connection where everybody can meet. And while we don't have the performance space or maybe the facilities that other places have, that it will be the network and the kind of community of people that will mm. grow it. And Sure, sure. Know. And I think hub is kind of the important word because what I discovered when I moved back to Clonmel was that in the absence of a hub, it's not that all arts activities stopped, it's just that people went and found their own space and did their own thing. So there was a lot of dislocation between mm, different things that were happening, a lot of fragmentation. And I think the Arts Centre is beginning to pull that all together, just in, in that idea of really creating a very strong arts community here in Clonmel. And obviously with associations, you know, we, we've also worked hard to create connections with Carrick, with Care, with mm -hmm. Feathered. Um, and, and I think that can, again, that will 
continue. And I think that will be enhanced by a Mm -hmm. podcast. And of course, the reach of a podcast goes well beyond South Tipperary. That's the Mm -hmm. really exciting thing about it. Um, the kind of the, the the virtual community is much greater than the community that you have physically present in the area. And there is yeah. definitely a public of, you know, there's a, a public of kind of real arts enthusiasts in Clonmel. There definitely is a core group of people. And again, they, are really, really I think good. it would be really yeah. useful for them to know mm. where do I go for the yeah. info about everything. Well, it's frustrating <laughs> when you're, choice. you know, you want to engage with things that you you can't seem to find out. Sure, sure. And that whole on. like thing of, I didn't know it was on, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that is the difficulty. And I think yeah. if we have a centralized place where we're putting information literally just about Clonmel, I suppose, in mm-hmm. the first instance. Um, but it can also obviously kind of things from, you know, care feathered, carry can yeah, trickle yeah, in yeah, as well. Yeah. Um it just helps it just helps in terms of having a, a, a focal point for people to look for information on the arts. Absolutely. Well, as many of you may know, the Finding a Voice Festival took place over the weekend of 8th to the 10th of March. And it was a really wonderful celebration of female composers. Absolutely wonderful music. It was very well received. Um, International Women's Day was quite a large inspiration for the curators of Finding a Voice since last year. As many of you might remember, there was um, quite a lovely exhibition in the Arts Centre to coincide with it, which featured four really well-known Irish uh, contemporary female artists. This year, Catherine Marshall, who curated Ain't I a Woman, which was last year's show, agreed to once again curate an exhibition for South Tip Art Centre that would sit hand in hand with the Finding a Voice Festival over this particular weekend and that would also feature um, an Irish woman artist um, and the choice for this year was Janet Mullarney, who, as uh, many of us may know, is a hugely well-respected Irish sculptor with massive international profile. Catherine Marshall is a curator, freelance art writer, art historian. She's worked for the Arts Council. She was head of collections at IMA from 1995 to 2007. So she's just a fountain of information on, on Irish art and art in general and a fascinating lady to speak to. So... Uh, While the exhibition was being installed, I had a chance to speak to Catherine about her response to Janet's work. One of the things that I was trying to do, because I've been connected with the Art Centre now for the last couple of years, is try to find an exhibition that would build on what we did last year with Aideen Barry, Mm -hmm. Cathy Prendergast and Pauline Cummins. In other words, find a good show about women to coincide with International Women's Day Mm -hmm. and the Finding a Voice pattern now that Clean has established. Uh-huh. So we looked for a woman artist and also because we wanted to bring some well-known artists to Clonmel but we didn't have any money to do it. Mm-hmm. So I asked some people I knew who owned work by Janet Malarney in their private collections mm-hmm. if they would lend us mm-hmm. work from their own collections and they did. So that's how this show came about. Some of them would have quite big art collections. Mary Ryder, who is, has been a friend of Janet since their school days, actually has a lot of work by Janet mm. because over the years they've done all kinds of favours for each other and Mary's acquired quite a bit of her work. But Mary, Mary would gave anything that she thought we might like to have. And I only picked four pieces from her collection. But four very good pieces. Um, this piece here, Mary Ryder has care of this at the moment and lent it to us, but actually this piece is about to be gifted to Mayo County Council because in 2016 I was curating an exhibition for Mayo County Council called the Mayo Collaborative and it was to be their response to 2016, 1916, their centenary celebration. But they decided to make their centenary celebration about a woman who had fought in the 1916 Rising and who had lived in County Mayo. She was born in County Mayo. She was also, though, a very interesting woman. She was a medical doctor who couldn't get a job because she was a woman, or they'd give her loads of jobs. She was a prize-winning student. So Kathleen Lynn was offered all kinds of jobs, but they didn't want to pay her, so she wouldn't take the jobs. And then eventually she did, but she, she got her own back in time. Sorry, let me get the sequence of her life. She took part in the 1916 Rising. She took over the command of City Hall when the commander, the male commander, was shot dead. 
and she took over and became the commander. So she and Countess Markovich would be the most senior women in the revolution, underdogs and everything. And it is as much about her mother as it is about Kathleen Lynn, because Janet's mother was always fighting battles on behalf of women and children, actually. But was also, um, oh, she was quite an eccentric person in my view. She, mm. she insisted that all her children be homeschooled. So they didn't go to school until they were of secondary school age. When, of course, they found it very difficult to fit into school. Yeah. So they were frequently suspended or complained about <laughs> yeah. because they were so independent. They were yeah. not troublesome, just yeah, independent. Just independent. And their mother always went in and defended them. But they just didn't have it's an easy time. To make, yeah. Very hard, yeah. yeah. So I think some of that made their relationship with their mother at times a bit questionable. So it's only later Janet came to realise just what an incredible gift their mother had, had given, given them, you know. Yeah. Um, because they all became extraordinarily creative mm. and independent in their thinking. The, the, the dress patterns, yeah. there's a skirt and a trousers. Okay. It's even-handed. It's about the mother believed in the equality of the yeah. sexes completely, never favoured yeah. one over the other. And, of course, it was her mother who taught them to sew, so Janet has made the horse's head. And, and I suppose another thing to say about her work is, look at the range of materials that she uses. It's sewing, it's carving, it's bits of just ordinary... Um, lats of wood just yeah, so like with the holes. sewing is very feminine as, you know traditionally but then she's you know, cast out yeah, of paper mache yeah, and later bronze kind of the little figure in not yeah. really but you know building boats or whatever exactly you know? yes exactly when she went to Italy first she did go to the Academy of Fine Art in Florence but she didn't like it the emphasis was very much on academic art and she already knew that she didn't want to go down that route. That road, yeah. But she did then get a job as an apprentice working with an antique furniture restorer. So he taught her all about wood. And she made the most exquisite, very fine art pieces from wood. Um, but then she threw it all aside to make pieces like, you know, this piece here, which is called Grotta d'Amore. And it's based on, it's a reference to a grotto, an Irish grotto or figure of the Blessed Virgin in a grotto and she's usually wearing blue but this cloak is made from sandpaper so it, in a way it is about something much tougher and not nearly as feminine it's carved out of wood but not with a fine finish it's more almost hacked out of wood and yet you know it's very expressive and then after that I suppose it's up to people who look at it to work out what they think is going on here. It seems to me there's definitely something about control going on between the, the figure of the mother and this little figure here has been gripped. Him, yeah. Yes. And the whole idea, apart from an Irish grotto, an Irish Catholic grotto, of course, it also refers to Italian medieval art where the figure of the Virgin with a cloak and her arms out mm-hmm. and with a whole lot of people, souls and people yeah, who are right. looking for help are gathered underneath it. Well, here, the people gathered underneath all tell a story and it would be very autobiographical. Right. In Italy, that figure with the with smaller the, figures under her cloak yeah. is called the Madonna of the Misery Chords or the Madonna of Mercy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a Madonna of Mercy, except that she doesn't look like a Madonna of Mercy. She's, oh. she's taking control here. And, but still, they love her. You know, yeah. They're in there. There's a bit of ambivalence about the emotions uh-huh. in this. Down here, clutching a little group of children. Yeah. That could be. I mean, she's Janet is one of quite a large family. Oh, right. Could be a reference to that. Yeah. There's a figure here with his head buried in a book. These figures here could be um, the artist and her artist partner, who together restored um, the house, an old Tuscan farmhouse. And so the house they're clutching could be a reference to that. Uh Also, interestingly, it is a reference to a fresco by Giotto, a very famous fresco, Uh where the man who paid for all the fresco decoration in this church is included in the painting by Giotto, and he's holding the church in in his arm. And it's it's like, this is mine because I have paid for the decoration of it. And then these figures here, I think these two anyway, 
certainly I think are just artistic references. They look to me very um, African. Yeah. She's very influenced by art from different ethnic communities. Uh -huh. This was made after she'd been to India. So when she was in India, she went, she didn't bring much in the way of art materials with her because she hadn't thought it was going to be that kind of trip. But actually she found herself making work out of things she found on the beaches and things. So making work out of whatever came her way. And so she made a whole exhibition actually called, in Italian it's called Squilibri Continuity, which I think means contained harmony or contained equilibrium. Anyway, whatever that means. She didn't make them in India, did she? No, she didn't. She okay. brought, but she, they were inspired was by... Was she gathering she did make, as she went along and bringing... She made stuff while she was there, yeah. but I, don't, I doubt if she made this in yeah. India. I don't know, but, but anyway, I suppose, when she came back, the general kind of flimsiness and ramshackle nature of all of this would have been inspired by how people just had to survive in yeah. India and especially the poorest of the poor. Because Janet had no money of her own either, you know, absolutely nothing. She was just getting around on her wits yeah. and doing a bit yeah. of work here and a bit of work there. And so, you know, something like this, which Condominio is, a, is an apartment block uh -huh. or a certain kind of apartment building mm -hmm. um, in Italian but look at this you know it is utterly flimsy and imagine anybody even beginning mm -hmm. to think about living in a place like that but so I suppose it's a comment on I suppose generally fragility and the very thing that should be the stable thing in our lives our where we live our home our shelter is so completely rickety and unstable that that's what this represents and then the other thing that's worth mentioning about it, I think, is that it's made from such different materials. Mm -hmm. And a real feature of Janet's work is that from the early 90s, she started to experiment with all kinds of different materials. So she would have started off by carving in wood mm -hmm. and doing some drawings and etching. She always did prints and drawings. But then the, the carving in wood gave way to carving from sponge mm -hmm. or foam from creating things using bits of natural um, twigs and branches and um, copper piping and... Everything looks like it has its own story, doesn't it? Does, it does, doesn't yeah, it? And it may well do. Yeah, exactly. And even this, you know... Bits of fabric, this would have been found on a beach, maybe that mm, might in be India. India. Yeah. This bit of metal up here, you know, they yeah. all belong to something. And, yeah. of course, there are stories behind all of them. But I suppose that notion of just making art out of anything... It's no longer, it's not about skill, although there's a tremendous amount of skill yeah, involved in precious. making stuff out of nothing yeah. and making something quite precious out of nothing mm -hmm. and yet making it still look as if it's really flimsy yeah. and yeah, it's going to yeah. disintegrate in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. But that's already 25 years old mm -hmm. and it's been hanging for 25 years and, you know, it's travelled around from, it's been shown in Italy, it's been shown in Ireland, it's been hanging in a private house in Ireland for yeah. the last it's nearly 25 well, years. It? It's doing just fine. And I mean, she loves boats as well. Boats are a motif in her work. Boats and animals and windows. And often you would get a figure with a boat on their heads and a window on top of that. So the window's all about looking. Mm -hmm. The boat is about, I suppose, it's about life and the journey. Yeah. Who knows, yeah. you know, but these are the and kind of things. she obviously is big into travel as a, you know... She is big into travel, but she's also about living your life, yeah. the journey of... And, yeah, there might or might not be a human figure associated mm -hmm. with all of that. There's no human figure here, but the fabric and stuff suggests the presence of humans. Mm -hmm. They've been in mm -hmm. and out of it. Uh, and then it deliberately shows all the joins and the seams and everything mm -hmm. else. Nothing pretends to be tidier or, you know, life is full of complications, actually, mm -hmm. in a work like this. Um, and it's patched. <laughs> yeah. in the way we all patch ourselves up and struggle and stay going and come up for air again or maybe even have an adventure, you know. Yeah, yeah. She's also a great reader, an absolutely inveterate reader. So, you know, there could be references here to The Ship of Fools, which is a big motif in literature, or to building your house on sand, you know, um, not having... Um, the proper foundations to build a stable home mm -hmm. and an awful lot of people don't have mm -hmm. a stable home, you know. So. And look at the moment where we're living, so...
Exactly, exactly. It's all as unstable as ever, you mm -hmm. know, just when you think we've got things sorted a bit, they all st start to disappear on us again. Um, and then, you know, all of this suggests that there was once proper rigging on this boat, um, mm -hmm. but now, of course, it's all in bits. It's very precarious. Is this up here, the crow's nest on the ship, or somebody's garden shed? <laughs> One of the archetypal stories from the Italian Renaissance is that Giotto um, was asked if he could draw a perfect circle or to draw a circle. And I think, you know, whoever asked him was more or less sneering, you know, mm -hmm. you can't draw a perfect circle, yeah, yeah. so what kind of an artist are you? And Giotto, who was only a child at the time, was said to have taken a stick and drawn in the sand, but he drew a perfect circle. So in a way, I think when Janet Mullarney then comes along and does something like this, She's, um, she's talking about the burden of art history. How do you live up to that? Yeah. And of course, she's an Irish artist in Italy, trying to be an artist in Florence, right in the home of it all, you know? And actually rejecting all that, saying, you know, I'm not really interested in showing off my skill. Because she had left Ireland as a teenager, having won every art competition open for children. That's how she paid her way to Italy on a magic bus or something, you know? Um, so she already seemed to be able to do things with great facility, but she wanted to prove that that's not what art was about. It was about the spirit behind it or something. So um, she made this in 2016 for an exhibition in High Lanes in Drogheda, which then travelled around the country. It went to, well, it went to Wimmer. It went to the Butler Gallery in Kilkenny. It went to the F.E. McWilliam Gallery in Banbridge in Northern Ireland. And it went to, I think, the Illin Art Centre in West Cork and the Wexford Art Centre. So it had a, once it got moving, everybody wanted a bit of it because it was made up of a huge light box mm. table, which had maybe 20 or 30 little figures oh, wow. like this on it. And then, uh, especially in High Lanes, it looked astonishing because the gallery in High Lanes is in an old Augustinian friary, I think, or it's, it's in okay. an old church mm -hmm. anyway. So where the, the altar in the church was, she hid the altar behind um, just big sheets of mm -hmm. MDF or something, painted yeah. white. And then in front of it, she hung a whole lot of cut out cardboard figures like these, yeah. but all doing different things. And she shone lights on them, so they cast shadows onto the MDF. Oh. The little figure, or the little group in the box, it's called Pieta, and it is about a family and a baby. It is a bit like Michelangelo's Pieta in the Vatican, the famous one, yeah. except that, you know, Janet Mullarney's a bit of a demon. She gets famous artwork, like Giotto and the Circle. Mm -hmm. She takes Michelangelo and she upends Michelangelo. So the baby is not the Christ, the dead Christ on the lap of his mother. It is a baby, but it's a baby animal. And the two creatures with the very human bodies have animal heads. And they are holding this baby between them. But there's something not very comfortable about the baby, not supported in the middle. There is a sense in which the baby is a bit precarious and these parents might let the baby fall. So that's a little bit of a comment on families and how families operate. And even the fact that it's in a box, it's in a wooden box. She made a whole series of these using boxes that she happened to have. They're just recycled boxes, yeah. but coated the inside of it with wallpaper, flock wallpaper, which actually looks like, you know, the fabrics, that, the tapestries and things, hangings in medieval Italian houses, yeah, yeah. you know. So there's a bit of that going on as well. There's also, I suppose a bit of a play on religion and I would say it wouldn't be pushing it too far to say there's a little bit of a questioning of the emphasis on it within the Catholic Church on the family without actually ever properly supporting the family, expecting the mother to do it all and you know we know all the things that have gone wrong as a result of that. Um, and bulls, I mean if you think about Animals have certain kinds of associations, so mm -hmm. bulls are seen as, you know, macho and yes, yeah. maybe highly sexualised. Yeah. So are goats. And so she has a piece in her house called Picasso's Goat. Okay. And it's made, it looks like, a little bit like a hedgehog in shape. It's got a human face, if I remember rightly. 
but the spines on it are all nails hammered into it, you know, so it's quite a tough piece. But it is also, being tough with Picasso is all right, because Picasso is well able to take it. No competition in a way, you know, <laughs> it's fair. In this case, the dog motif in Janet's work is often, is, she loves animals, she's very good with animals, um, but also she's very conscious of sort of the connection between humans and animals and how... Um, you know, we think of animals as beasts, and when you say the word beast, you immediately think of brutal and savage. And, but actually, it doesn't have to mean that at all. And if we say that about an animal, we have to acknowledge it about ourselves too. So the, the dogs often are, they're sort of quite uh, randy dogs as yeah. well. And sometimes by using the animal, mm. she's deliberately using the animal as a way of universalizing the human. You know, saying this is really about people and how we feel, but you know, you can show it better in the disguise of an animal. And so, I mean, this animal looks quite fierce, but yet, you know, this shy, shrinking human figure seems to be quite safe. The animal isn't it's going quite near calm it. while it's yeah, does exactly. look a little nervous. Uh -huh. Yeah, but Freaking that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's very colourful. Again, you know, Janet doesn't try to... She doesn't try to do anything in a conventionally decorative or pretty way or anything. Her drawings are big and very strongly expressive and individualistic, you know. Some of them are huge. You know, maybe a lot of her drawings are, you know, a metre and a half long by a metre high, you know, that kind of size. Um, this is a bit smaller. But this is obviously connected with work she's done. Like the little Alma Trovata, the figure on the bed has an animal um, at the foot of the bed and there's a, a relationship between the two of them. Um, that's called Alma Trovata. Now, I think that means a soul that has been found. And this is also called Alma Trovata. She was thinking of, it should be seen up at this height. Mm -hmm. So they're like um, the spirit of the house, protecting the house. Um, and she made these little, little mattresses for them herself as a way of showing that she cared about them. So they're quite beautiful little things, I think. She made a series of those, at least 12 of them. And I don't think she ever seriously, you know, uh, she did exhibit them, but I don't think she ever seriously tried to sell them or anything. Yeah. Need to do. I think she's in no way a commercial artist. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the prints, when you make a print, you make a print and you run off yeah. 25 yeah. copies. And this is 7 out of 28. But then Janet, she's gone over, she's gone over every <laughs> so single one, one of them. So they're all different. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes she draws on a little bit onto them oh. or something. So there's no two are ever all totally the same. unique then. Yeah. Yeah. And then this piece over here, which is called let's see, Just One Day, for Catherine with Love, it was very nice of her, yeah. She, I was in her house about a year and a half ago, and she had been to Africa, and she had seen this little figure, funny sort of bird, standing on one leg, and she had been drawing the bird, and I thought it was lovely, and my daughter had just been to Ethiopia, and had come back with a little tiny wooden bird for me. Oh which also was black and white with little spots. Anyway, we talked about it. And Janet had just been making these sketches. So she gave me the sketch. And so look, houses and a little figure on top. With This refers to another series of work that she's done. A figure putting about to put a mask on the head. And the mask is an animal mask. Yeah. It's like a deer or something. She's made a series of deer masks in glass. But the idea is... I think it's something to do with shyness or, yeah, needing to, feeling that you need some kind of protection from the world. Like yes, except that the out. mask is made of glass. Yeah. So you see through it, mm -hmm. it's transparent, it doesn't do the job of a mask. Mm -hmm. And yet in some way, she feels the need of it, you know. Um, and the clouds refer to another motif in her work where she did... Architects are very interested in her work, and so the um, the really prize-winning Irish architects, John Toomey and Sheila O'Donnell, were designing a school in Blanchardstown in Dublin, Terry Orchard, and they asked Janet to decorate the school for them. So she did about maybe 20 pieces, some of them with these glass masks, but some in the library. 
She made these beautiful floating cushions that are cloud. They hang down and kids sit and dream, daydream. Janet thought the daydreaming was the most important part yeah. of your education. Just think somebody who had been homeschooled would bring that exactly. to the table. Exactly, exactly. So that's, that's a reference to those little clouds, you know. Beautiful, isn't it? It's lovely, just whimsical little drawing. It's not meant to be a serious artwork, but it is lovely. And so we come to the end of the very first South Tip Arts podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. And I will speak to you all again in two weeks. Don't forget our email address is southtipartspodcast at gmail.com. So if there's anything you know of that you think needs to be highlighted by this podcast, please get in touch with me and I'll speak to you all in two weeks.